Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Northwest Illinois Agronomy Summit. My name is Philip Alberti, and I'm the commercial agriculture educator with the University of Illinois Extension in Stevenson, Joe Davis, and Winnebago counties. Uh, I'm pleased today to welcome uh, Dr. Salah Issa, who is an extension specialist for the University of Illinois. Uh, specifically, he is an assistant professor in industrial safety and health. And today he's going to be talking to us about grain bin safety. All of these resources and videos on production will be posted to our website, uh, which you can find on the screen right now. Uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome our professor and speaker for today, uh, Dr. Sal Eason. Sal, thank you so much for being with us today. Take it away. So I, as I said earlier, this uh, grant was funded and produced from uh, a grant they received from OSHA. And it's important uh, to note that the contents in this grant do not represent the views, uh, do not necessarily represent the views or policies of the US Department of Labor. And if we do mention any trade names or commercial products, it does not imply any endorsement by the US government. Uh, and these, these next uh, few slides, we just have to give these reminders. Second, uh, since this was also funded by OSHA, we have to remind that employees have rights. They are entitled to safe and healthy working condition. They're, entire, uh, they're entitled for fair compensation for all hours worked. And they're entitled to report any unsafe conditions without retaliation. Uh, if they're, and they can call, email, or write to OSHA area office. So let's get started. So today we're just going to go over grain facts. We're going to talk about the hazards of grain bin entry. We're going to talk about assessing uh, entry conditions. Uh, quickly go over how to how to go about procedures for uh, safe entry, such as fall protection and lockout tagout, and just a summary at the end. And then we'll do a post test using Kahoot, similar to what we did in the pre test. So. When it comes to grain entrapments, every year we're, we're seeing 20 to 40 uh, entrapments yearly. On a more recent trend, I would say that the frequency has increased uh, last year, um, actually 2019, uh, the last year's the reports are not out yet. We had 38 incidents, uh, which was a significant, a significant increase over previous years. But in general, in the long-term trends, we're seeing between two, uh, 20 to 40 uh, cases every year. And, and, and these cases that we see are basically what we get mostly from news clippings. So there's, there's definitely an underreporting, right? Just imagine, uh, just imagine the cases that would be considered newsworthy and what would not be considered newsworthy. And, and you can understand how, in a sense, our best efforts at trying to predict what's going on will always underestimate the number of uh, entrapments every year. Of those cases that we do see, generally about 50% result in death, sometimes a bit more. I think 2019 was about 60%, sometimes a bit less. We've seen 40, 30%, but around 50. And the vast majority involves corn. And this is why when we do these, this focus, we, do, we tend to focus a lot on corn uh, because the vast majority of these cases involve corn, but we, we do see them in soybean, in wheat, and in, um, in rice, and cotton seed, in canola seed. So they can happen in almost any type of grain. And uh, the majority occur at basically at store sites. And as I mentioned earlier, since we depend on use clippings, it's very highly likely that there's more underreported non-fatal cases than basically what we get for fatal. Because again, it, it depends what the newspaper thought was worthy of printing. So uh, a lot of uh, so one of the trends why even with all the work that we've been done, uh, we've we've done we've seen consistent cases is that over the years, we've seen higher yields, more product movement, and all that leads to greater exposure, right? You're handling grain more. And if you're handling grain more, then there's a high, then there is, you have greater exposure, which basically increases your risk overall. 
And we can see that, for example, uh, corn over the last uh, 30 years has increased, uh, the yield has increased by 93%, so I mean by 49%, and 70% of the grain is being stored. And uh, so that, that's in a sense what we're, we are seeing uh, going on in the US uh, today. And that leads to a rising need to best practices. This is why we do this presentation. You know, as the grain bins get larger, more volume is being moved, we have to have a, a standard a set of ideas of how to tackle the issues with grain storage to keep our workers and our farmers safe. When, when I do this presentation, I use entrapment and engulfment. And sometimes when I talk about entrapments, I, I sometimes use that generally, but more specifically, when we talk about entrapment, it's a partial submersion. So for example, you're in a grain uh, storage bin and you're entrapped basically to your shoulders or all the way up to your neck. We consider that an entrapment because you, your airways are still open. So you could theoretically, at the very least, you can still breathe. And uh, it's important to note that when grain actually leaves your knees, uh, reaches, when grain level reaches your knees, that you can't self-rescue uh, yourself. You need somebody else to help you. And in that definition, that's what we consider entrapment. When it comes to engulfment, engulfment is you're totally submerged uh, in grain. And uh, that's where we see a lot of our fatalities. So I, I did a study on basically over a thousand entrapment cases, and I split them out by entrapment and engulfment. And when it came to entrapments, 12% uh, of the entrapments were fatal. Uh, but when we are looking at engulfments, about 92% of our engulfments are fatal. So the vast majority of engulfments are fatal. So it's important to note that 8% do survive. And also just as important to note that about 12% of our entrapments, they're fatal. Um, so that, that's something important to note and keep in, your, uh, keep in the back of, uh, back of your mind. So, so just generally with grain, just in general, because it's a granular object, just walking through it, you naturally, uh, you naturally sink about 12 feet, uh, 12 inches, sorry. So that's just a natural, just walking through the grain. And that's just a general average. And, and you have to realize that as a human body, you are just two or three bushels, basically. So if you get trapped in a grain bin and the auger is flowing and it's flowing at 4,000 bushels per, per second, you can realize how quickly you can get entrapped in, or actually engulfed in such a situation. And when it comes to entrapments, even though your air, your, uh, your, you can breathe, right? There, there are, or your air flows are open. There's a, there's a lot of hazards that you need to be aware of. The grain mass will apply significant pressure on your chest. Uh, in a study I did a few years ago, it's probably four times uh, the, the pressure that you'd experience if you were in water, uh, like swimming. So, and that, pre uh, that pressure means that even if you kept your airways open so you can still breathe, that pressure uh, is enough to constrict your, your chest and will cause over time, it will cause a, a, a death or fatality. This is, not, this is not very different than, for example, a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor, when it goes and tightens the, the body and it kills the prey, the way it kills the prey, it's not, it's not stopping uh, breathing. It's actually, it's, uh, it's increasing that blood pressure. It's in, uh, by applying external pressure to the point that that creature basically has a heart attack or, or, or something like that happens. And, and that's similar with the body. We had a case study of uh, a victim who was entrapped to his shoulders. Uh, uh, and he was experiencing a lot of, like, a lot of pain in his chest. And they tried to give him medication, didn't it help. They, they tried to pull him out quick, quickly, that made the pain more severe. Finally, they took basically, um, they took a grain rescue tube, which I'll show pictures later on, and they put it around the person and they sucked out all the grain around him and suddenly all his pain disappeared. 
So that's that's one way that's uh, that can actually uh, that is dangerous in grain entrapments. Also, you know, you have uh, there's dust, there's grain around. You can easily inhale grain or ingest. Grain likes to go from uh, high level to down, and it can it can easily go into your lungs. Uh, they they. Uh, one, uh, there's a young boy who got entrapped in grain, and he survived. But when they when they looked at it, they found his lungs were just basically had a lot of grain in it, and they had to go into immediate surgery to clear out that grain. Also, when you're dealing with basically wanting grain, uh, especially in silos, there's you have to be careful about the atmospheric pressures. Uh, I mean, the atmospheric gases is. Uh, Oxygen might get displaced by carbon dioxide, or you might have uh, uh, nitrous gas, which is basically poisonous. So that's just general idea of all the physical effects that you can experience in when you get entrapped or engulfed with grain. And the uh, grain is uh, it's pretty quick. So it's it's basically within five seconds you're buried to your knees. And as we said earlier, once you're buried to your knees, you you can't self-extricate. It takes, uh, to get fully buried, it takes anywhere between 30 seconds to a minute. And um, so that, that's what you have to keep in mind. And as our grain bins are getting larger, our augers or our systems to move the grain are also getting larger and faster. And so that, that uh, statistic is only going to get worse. Uh, so here, for example, he's a, just, just to show you how flowing grain acts. This is... <laughs> It's a very nice uh, video, actually. Pretty shocking. Can you guys hear the video? Uh, I cannot. Okay. There we go. Now we can. See, it's, it's, it does it in a way that it's unsuspecting, but once they're entrapped at a certain level, they can't self-extricate. You find them going in straight into the grain mass. Insane. I don't know if anybody has seen anything like this. The thing is, when it comes to grain, it tends to empty out from the surface. So there is no place here where the, 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 the pigeons are safe. They'll all end up into the, basically get sucked in into the flowing grain. And uh, when it comes to extricating the victim, so something we used to see in the past, well, okay, the guy has entrapped his knees or chest. Let me just set up a harness around his body and just pull him out. <laughs> There's a lot of danger associated with that because the grain has basically acts as a fictional force against your body. So it's, it's not just they're extricating the body. There's this pressure and force against your body uh, when you're entrapped in grain. So uh, if you're fully entrapped, it can be basically four times your weight needed to extract you. And, uh, and some studies, some preliminary studies show that at least with, for example, lamp spine, that's, that's the amount of force needed to cause an injury. We haven't seen a lot of injuries from being, from individual being extricated, but we have seen some. There was a case in California in wheat where he was entrapped to the grain to his chest. And uh, the, I think it was uh, the first responders, they came, they put a harness around him and they pulled him really too quickly. And basically he, he lost the capacity to walk for a few months until he recovered. And still with, when it comes to walking, it, it's very imbalanced and he can fall easily, he has to use a cane. So it can definitely be um, a hazard to watch out for. So common hazards of grain, right? In a summary, so you have flowing grain. That's, that's a major hazard. You have poor grain conditions. 
which in a sense you can break it up into three parts. You have a plug sum, which is where we see the majority of our grain entrapments, because and a plug a plug sum relates really easily with the flow and grain as well. We see avalanches, which is basically the grain is at the wrong uh, angle uh, and it's you're and it's stuck on, on the walls and you're poking it and it falls down. And then we have bridging conditions as well. And then other things to watch out for is atmosphere, wind conditions, and also your employee experience. Uh, a, a quarter of the incidents we've documented uh, have been for workers, young workers under the age of 21. And all the way, I think the youngest, but this was in case of a worker, but it's also important to note, the youngest we have that got engulfed in a grain mass was, I think it was two or three years old. And they were just playing with grain, uh, but that, that's something to keep in mind. And so the number one is flowing grain. What makes flowing grain so dangerous is that a lot of times uh, farmers send uh, their workers to basically walk around the grain mass to break up the clumps so it doesn't plug the, the auger later on. And uh, the way the grain flows, actually I actually have another picture. The way the grain flows, it's always from the top and, and into the center. So even if you're on the sides, you're actually, the grain is flowing against you. And again, once it pulls you into your knees, it's, uh, it will, it's, you're under flowing grain and it could pull you straight down. We had uh, one of the saddest cases was in 2010, where you had four young workers all sent into a huge commercial grain facility in Illinois. And they were told to just walk the grain and break up all the crumbs. And one, one youth started getting entrapped in grain. The other one tried to save him. He got pulled in two and the same happened with the third one. The fourth one was partially entrapped, was able to get out and call for help. But by the time help came, uh, already uh, two of the three boys were fully engulfed under grain and one was basically entrapped his shoulders and, and they had to, and sadly, those two boys did not make it. And uh, on top of that, even, even to do this rescue, it took over 12 hours uh, to, uh, to rescue these boys. So, so flowing grain, basically, it's acting like quicksand, right? You're walking in, and it pulls you in, and it pulls you from, basically, it, when you're emptying a grain bin, it doesn't empty from bottom to top. The grain bin empties from top to bottom. So that's why uh, flowing grain tends to be a very hazardous condition. Another important thing is bad uh, grain quality and that impacts our flowing grain, impacts our avalanche, impacts our bridging. And, uh, and as, a, as a producer or a worker or a manager, you, you need to know that can, the, the telltale signs of bad grain. You know, if there's uh, uh, pockets of hot temperature, there's high moisture, especially when you entered it. If, if when you're walking in, there's restricted movement, you're not falling down. If it smells bad, you know, it smells mold, moldy, musty, or fermented, or if you actually see these columns of self, you know that you're dealing with bad grain and it's really important that you follow the right procedures uh, to ensure that you clean it out safely. So here's, here's a, a a video on basically bad grain to show you how it looks like. So there's all. Now, this is quality corn. Taking five loads out of this bin and we still can't get through it. Why won't it come down? Whatever. You can see when he was generally walking, basically, the grain wasn't giving in. So that shows you this is bad quality grain. And then also you can see that there's some of the grain mass there is sprouting as well. Well, let's keep jumping. And also early on, I don't know if you noticed uh, that you had that worker walk over the PTO shaft. That's actually another very dangerous hazard. Because if, uh, if, if it, he, he can easily have gotten entangled in that, and that could have been very painful or fatal, at least. 
And the majority of our entrapments occur basically because our farmer, our worker, our producer is trying to unplug a sump. So the, he's emptying grain, grain gets stuck, it's not flowing. And so he goes inside and takes a big rod and he's basically trying to unplug the sump. And then he's, because he doesn't know whether he succeeded in unclogging the sump or not, usually they leave the machines running. Then suddenly it clogs the sump and it, it just pulls them straight down. That is, I, I would say that's the majority of the cases that we see. And that is something it's important as a producer or a farmer or a manager to think about before you start putting grain into this, what are the alternative methods that you can safely uh, unplug the sump from, out, from outside? What can you do, whether it's setting up an exterior opening that gives you access to your sump, having tunnels or stuff like that? That's a, that's a critical question that you need to ask yourself before you fill grain, uh, because that's, that's really the, most, the biggest hazard that we see. Uh, so, and we have, uh, for example, one story is uh, a 60 year old worker. He had over 41 years of experience of working with grain. So it's, and, and that's actually our second most number of incidents we see. So I told you about 25% that occur to youth under the age of 21. Uh, the next group is that youth over the age of 60. Can everybody see me all right? And hear me all right? We can hear you okay, uh, Sala, but I, the video has just been a little bit laggy. Okay. okay. I'm going to turn off my video because uh, I, I, I have a saying unstable internet. So I turn off my video to save on bandwidth. So in this case, um, you know, they had the experience, as I said earlier, so the next a largest number of incidents that we see in uh, grain entrapments are are basically uh, workers age 60 and above. That that represents another 25% of all cases. So 50% of our cases is workers under age of 21, or or basically workers above the age of uh, 60. So keep that in mind. So uh, and a lot of times they have the experience, they know what needs to be done. And a lot of times they're just taking a shortcut. They've done it a million times, they're always safe. Let me just do a shortcut here. And, and that's where it gets them. And, and similar with this case. So we have 41 years of experience who works alone. They empty the grain bin when it clogged. At that time, the side opening was already at the, the height of the grain so they could go in. And uh, basically, there's about 15 bushels in the in the bin uh, bin left, uh, in the grain bin left, and they thought that the manager thought in this case, oh, clearly they're at the surface level, so we can just it should be safe for the person to come and basically unclog the auger. And what happened is is that he unclogged it; it was successful. But then all that grain that was flowing down, he got completely caught in it and he was completely submerged. He was wearing a hat. And that hat bill basically ended up creating an air pocket for him. Uh, and, and that allowed him to survive. And, but, uh, but his left uh, foot got caught in the screw conveyor. And it took a five hour rescue and they had to basically amputate him on site. Um, his, and his survival was just because of that air pocket. It, if it wasn't for the air pocket, he would not have survived. And we have seen other similar cases where, where the worker goes all the way down through and actually gets entangled into the auger itself. So the next main uh, method is really is avalanche. So uh, avalanche tends to be, you, can, you see these columns basically develop and a lot of times we see workers trying to approach that column from beneath to, uh, to pluck on it and trying to get it to flow. And then they don't, it's, it's hard to estimate in a sense the volume, how much content is there. And uh, we tend to be really bad at it, even though most of us think we're good at it. And so once it starts flowing, it just completely engulfs them. And what makes avalanche in terms of rescuing a lot harder is that at the very least with flowing grain, 
you know where the victim is. He is going to be more, most likely than not in the center of the green bin. In this case, with an avalanche, you'd actually have no idea. He could be anywhere in the grain bin, depending on how the, uh, how the, basically the grain moved him. And that, that is, that's another big hazard we see. And that's probably our second most frequent uh, number of cases that we see. And, and some of these columns can be really high. So these columns can be up to 60 feet high. And so a lot of times we see workers going into these not realizing how much grain mass is actually in these columns. Our third uh, type of fatality we see is bridging. So that is due to grain clumps. So that's usually to, due to poor aeration or basically moisture has developed on the surface of the grain and it dries and then it forms this crust. And um, you empty the grain uh, you, you usually empty the grain, it creates this cavity. But when you're looking inside, your grain looks full. So you're thinking, well, what's going on? My grain stopped flowing, but it's, it's full. Let me go check it in. They, a lot of times they go in, they're walking around it, they're walking on top of it, trying to figure out what's going on. And that's, that's where we see, uh, that's where basically that crust that looks so solid like a bridge, it just collapses. And, and basically engulfs the person. We had a very sad scenario where a father and his young son went into a grain bin with crusting. And the son quickly ran over from one side to another and nothing happened because he didn't weigh enough. And then when the father went after him, he uh, basically the crust broke and engulfed him. Uh, lastly, one of the, one of the basically uh, maintenance tips in terms of uh, in terms of keeping your grain good quality is actually removing and coring the bin to remove all the, the fines. So that, that's usually basically five to ten percent of all the grain you have and and you empty it out to get rid of the fines because when you're filling the grain bin because the fines tend to have a smaller density than your uh, and, and tend to be a lot smaller than your grain, they tend to go in the center while your grain basically fills the sides. And, and this causes a lot of issues when it comes to basically aeration. And it, it can, and also can, uh, a lot of mold and stuff like that, they can start growing in that, these fines. So, uh, so basically pouring it and, and adding it back, you can reduce the fines in the center improve your airflow, and better uh, able to monitor the quality of the grain. So here is an example, basically, of, of how, like to show you how when you fill a grain mass, it tends to how uh, basically our grain finds tend to fill in. And this is just, uh, I think, rice with cinnamon, just to show you. And you can see as you start filling, you can see the cinnamon for the most part is filling in the center and it's not moving much. Well, you can look here on each, each side. Actually, I think this is a uh, uh, coarse salt. Uh, but you can see on each side, you have all your coarse grain. So you can see how a lot of your fines, even though it's, it might have mixed, been mixed up there, a lot of the fines basically form near the core while your coarse grain is on the sides. And this causes a huge issue in terms of uh, aeration and, and drying your grain properly. Okay, and, and we do see so a lot of incidents on, in, not a lot, but some in moving and flowing grain, flat storages, towers and pyramids. Uh, one hazard is that when you when you created that your uh, open pile, your ground pile, it might not be it might not have stabilized. So you're walking on top, it can create this mini avalanche and basically in, in, in engulf you in grain just a few inches under grain, but that that's enough to suffocate you. And we've seen a few cases like that. And similar to avalanches, one of the hardest things about that is that you don't know where the body is. So you can't do a quick recovery.
Uh, la uh, another important uh, hazard, and we talked about this, so I'm not going to go focus on, is employee experience. So we see a lot of new hires. That's we see the risk. They don't know the, the risks associated with green bins. And also, and even if they know, they don't know how to assess properly whether the environment they're going is risky or not. And similarly, we see experienced workers, like they, they, they have their habits, they became complacent. So those are the where we see the majority of our incidents. And lastly, other green conditions that contribute to these hazards is insufficient lighting, dust presence, rodents, and temperature. Um, dust presence, by the way, can also be combustible. Uh, we see that more in our basically concrete silos, uh, but the, it is possible. So here's here's an example of basically a demo of uh, of a grain dust to show you how combustible uh, grain dust is. Hi, I'm Dave Hill from Penn State Extension. Today, I want to demonstrate the effects of a dust explosion. We have built this model behind me to use in our feed mill and grain elevator fire programs that we conduct to our local fire companies in our agriculture rescue training programs here at Penn State University. Dust explosions can be very devastating, not only to the operators of businesses that make dust like feed mills, grain elevators, furniture manufacturers, but also to the fire company personnel that arrive on scene to manage a fire caused by a dust explosion. For a dust explosion to occur, you need dust. That dust needs to be put in suspension. It needs to be in a contained area. You need a heat source and you need a supply of air. Our model will supply all of these ingredients in a controlled setting. As you watch the demonstration, you will see our heat source and then you'll see a dust we be put in suspension with a shot of air. This will cause the initial explosion in our first containment room over here. This explosion will blow into our second room where it will pick up more dust before consuming the larger room with flame. Finally, the pressure will blow through a panel we have underneath our shanty up here. The entire explosion event will take less than two seconds to occur. We will show it to you in real time and then we'll show it to you in slow motion so you can see it in greater detail. This is in slow motion. We generally put a paper here so to control where the pressure and release of of this explosion occurs. Uh, but in a grain bin or in a silo, you don't have that. So it, it, wherever that weakest point is, that's where it will, it will break and destroy that silo. Okay, and, and similar rodents, and uh, you have to, with rodents, they can spread contamination, diseases, they can also uh, cause grain quality issues as well. And, and they, then they can actually uh, ruin your wiring as well. So what's critical when you want to go in the grain bin is check the angle of repose. It depends on the corn, depends on the, how dry the corn is. But generally, normally you see for corn about 21, uh, about 21 uh, 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 degrees, soybean at 25 degrees. And if it's steep, that's when you know there's some sort of hazard. The grain is not, has not been dried correctly. It is uh, something is going on that grain bin to be aware of. So the corn we said 21 to 23, soybeans 25 to 27, wheat is 27 to 28. Uh, so that's basically, uh, so that is something important for you to watch, to know in a sense what's going on basically with your, uh, uh, with your, with your grain. And if, if you see it moldy or musty or high temperatures, there's leaks in the bin, 
Uh, the angle of free flows does not match our 22 to 28 degrees on even slopes. That's that's when you you know to stay away. That you know to use lockout tag outs. You have to use the right equipment, which we'll talk about in more detail right now. So the number one, the number one factor in engulfment is no lockout tag out. We had a case of three workers. They went into a grain hopper. And their job was just to fix the roof. It had nothing to do with the grain. They went in, they were wearing their harnesses, their lifelines, they followed all the procedures. And one of the steps, if there's no engulfment hazards, they can take off their lifelines. They did so, and they started working on repairing that roof. A trucker come by, uh, comes by, he doesn't see anybody, he wants his grain, he turns on, uh, he basically uh, opens up uh, the grain hopper and he gets his grain and it sucks in all, all three workers and, and they all die. So that's the number one uh, safety thing is anytime you're using equipment, not just grain bins, always do walk out, tag out to protect yourself because you never know when somebody else comes, they don't know you're in the grain bin uh, and then they turn on the equipment for whatever reason. So turn off all, all energy sources, right? And with, when you're using a lock and tag out, make sure that you lock it out and you're tagging it out so that basically uh, that other workers, other employees or other family members, they know that somebody's in a grain bin. And even if they wanted to try to open it, they can't open it because you are the only one who has that key. Usually they have more than one hole. So if more than one work goes in, each one can lock, uh, lock it out and tag it out. And that, that in a sense that even if one worker leaves and takes his block, uh, the other worker is still in, it will basically still keep them safe. And another thing is proper use of fault restraint and the rest systems. Uh, this, is, this is really critical to get training in because um, in a small study I did, basically uh, the harnesses protected only very few farmers who wore them because they were misused they were, they were not used correctly. Either basically they, they tried to use ropes, assuming that would save them. They tried to, they used harnesses, but they didn't have the correct uh, fall arrest system. So when the grain started pulling them, it would continue to pull uh, because basically the fall arrest was not designed correctly and, and so on. Um, and another component is the anchor point. That anchor point, I mentioned earlier, it's up to 1,500 pounds from being pulled down in the grain. So that anchor point needs to be at, at least twice as strong as any anticipated forces. We have cases of farmers wearing the harnesses, doing everything, but they're tying it to an in uh, uh, the ladder inside the grain bin. And that ladder is only designed to experience basically 300 pounds of force. So we do have cases where the, the farmer gets pulled in, uh, there's that tension with the ladder and the, uh, the ladder breaks free of the grain bin. And also it's important to make sure and to work with your uh, manufacturer to see where on your grain bin can support that weight. Because uh, some beams on the roof are not designed to support that weight. We had a case where they, they were tied off to a, uh, to a beam and that beam broke when they got in, uh, engulfed in grain. Another thing, it's, it's critical, and this is one of the hardest things to implement, but it's critical not to enter alone. Um, I can't tell you how many cases we have, both they survived or they didn't, where they're entrapped in grain and nobody knows. Um, finally at dinner, the wife calls and says, I, my husband did come back home, what's going on? That's when they start looking for him and then they find, for example, a truck nearby or something like that. Um, so it's critical to do observer. I, uh, that this observer, it's critical for him to help with control of the lifeline. Uh, you know, just having a rope basically connected to an anchor point that's not tight, it does nothing. It will still pull you straight in. You have to have an observer to keep that line tight for you. And if anything goes wrong, he can ask and try to get help for you. That's, a, that's another critical component. Uh, you have to be careful in terms of atmosphere. So before you enter your, your grain bin, it's, it's, it's always a good idea to ventilate, to eliminate any potential hazards. 
and also to test your grain, uh, your your atmospheres. This is particularly important in silos, which tend to be uh, tend to build up with carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxides, which can be uh, fatal. Um, and uh, it's really cheap and really easy to buy a, a, a multi-gas monitor to check that the oxygen levels meet basically what you need to breathe. You need above 19.5 uh, to be able to, uh, to breathe air and to, uh, to survive and to watch out for any uh, basically toxic agents. Uh, carbon dioxide is not necessarily toxic. It, it doesn't really kill you from the sake that it's a toxic gas. It's more that it displaces the oxygen. So it reduces the availability of oxygen that you have. And, uh, and that's something critical to think about. It's doing that testing, making sure that uh, you enter when you know the atmosphere is safe. Also, if you're using uh, fumigants in your grain bin, make sure you know the concentrations, make sure that the workers are trained properly on how to do it. And, uh, and know how to keep themselves safe and they're wearing all the PPE required to stay safe. We've had cases where when workers are fumigating the grain bin, they basically overwhelm themselves and they lose consciousness, the consciousness and they, they end up dying there. And there are rescue tubes available. If somebody gets entrapped in grain, you have basically, you have a lot of different tubes. There's a lot of different manufacturers that make them. Uh, you can also basically make your own tube. Uh, it could be just a garbage can or stuff like that. The whole point of that tube is to put it around the victim and then remove the grain mass around the victim to be able to safely extricate the victim. That's the whole point of the tube. And obviously it will only work in an entrapment. And, um, and a lot of uh, fire uh, rescue departments these days, they, they have been purchasing, purchasing them. So we're seeing that more and more frequent. And the idea is that by removing the grain, you, you stabilize the victim. Because if you don't have that grain tube around the victim, it's impossible to remove the grain, right? Because if you're trying to remove the grain, more grain will just go, go and flow in and uh, keep your individual uh, locked. And, and, you know, in your facility, set up policies and procedures like lockout, tag out, grain bin entry, housekeeping and maintenance. Set them beforehand, implement them beforehand, um, and that is one of the major things that you can keep your workers safe is by when you set up these policies, when you give your workers the needed training, they understand the hazards themselves. And, and that's one way to keep them safe. And, and make sure not to allow any unsafe activities occur in your facility, which walking down the grain, that's one of the most dangerous ones. <clears throat> Uh, do not enter below grain level and also do not work alone. And so quick summary, uh, engulfments take less than 60 seconds. Uh, you have a lot of different hazards in our grain bins. Fallen grain up is one of the main ones, but also the poor condition of grain plays a big role in that. Watch out for the atmosphere, train your employees, uh, make sure to use life out, tag outs, life lands. Do not go into grain bin alone. And um, yeah, and that is that is about it.